you mentioned writers about 30, nearly 30 years ago, uh, I was taken over to London to go and meet the editor-in-chief of Reuters, a chap called Mark Wood, <clears throat> and I tried to persuade him then that we should set up an environment desk, <clears throat> I suggested New York, and I suggested me, uh, to cover climate change. And he looked at me with some contempt and he said, how would we monetize that? And he sent me back to South Africa to cover the uprising, which is where I was for a whole lot longer after that. And that question, in a way, is quite relevant to what we are thinking about here. How do you make it relevant to media, to newspapers, to spend time, resources, and newspaper space on a topic like climate change or environment more generally? Some newspapers, and I'm not one of them, are able to have an environment correspondent, and they're, they're very lucky. But um, in a place like East London, everybody does all sorts of things, and there isn't a lot of resource to do that. So uh, when... Um, William asked me to come along to this. It was quite useful to me because I had been trying to think about what we should be doing down there on COP17 specifically, and we will, in fact, tomorrow have a double spread on it in the Saturday dispatch, <clears throat> and we have set up some plans for, for covering. But it set me to thinking how to look at coverage of climate change and specifically COP17, and I think the most interesting precedent on it is the coverage because this is the next global catastrophe, and it's in many ways quite similar. That one started with a message from a number of people in the know to the masses out there who didn't really believe it and didn't really want to hear the message. And I think 30 years ago, that's where the AIDS coverage was. Uh, it was driven over many, many years by people much like yourselves in that arena, and probably some of, your, some of you were in that arena, people who had a personal commitment to it, had made their lives in that area, and were trying to spread a, a message. Um, the primary discourse was driven by activists, by lobbyists, by victims, legislators, and then there are always those people hanging around who think they can make money out of it. Now, some 30 years on, AIDS is pretty much part of the daily discourse. There are still dissidents. A lot of people haven't bought into protection. A lot of people are not doing the right things, but at least everybody knows what it is, talks about it, and on some level takes it seriously. And that's probably about as far as it's going to get. So on climate change, I would agree, as I'm sure everybody in this room would, though not everybody who writes about it, that that is the next global catastrophe. So should we cover it? If we should cover it, how should we cover it? And in a way, one of the most important questions is who should we cover it for? There is, you know, the why of it. There is a growing number of people out there who tell us that this is the, the, the looming catastrophe and that it's going to change the world, change the planet, and change our lives. And they're probably right. From the media's point of view, I'm not a great one for taking positions on things like this, I would rather tell the story and let the positions emerge. So I'm not terribly keen on hugely committed programs, campaigns on things like this. I think really the only sides that journalists should choose is between right and wrong, between good and evil. But of course, if you do that, then most, <coughs> I'm sure everyone in this room would say, well, good and right is on the climate change activist side. Um, so I think there are, there are four points that I'd, I'd like to, to touch on in how we, how we take it forward, and two upfront traps. Um, one of those is the allure of the insider, and it happens in a lot of specialist areas of journalism where one becomes in the know and you speak in the jargon of the, air, the, the whatever it is you're covering. You talk about COP and you talk about all sorts of acronyms and everything. You, you can have a whole conversation where you can use 17 acronyms and everybody knows. And it, it's quite a nice feeling, to, if you're a journalist, to be an insider. If you report crime, it's quite nice to know the cops and the people in the hospitals and the people in the courts. Because you get greeted, you're, you become a, a kind of a specialist and, and there's an acceptance that goes with that and often a social circle that goes with that. 
but it can work against what you're trying to do. So one does have to be very careful with that because you become part of a, a group who have a particular um, program that they, want to, that they want to promote and you become isolated from the people you're trying to talk to. The other, going back to AIDS, is the numbers race. If you remember when we were first trying to put HIV AIDS on the agenda, it was, well, it's going to kill 5 million people. No, 10 million people, 12, 18, 33. You raced up there. But once you got beyond a million people, nobody knows the difference between 1 and 2 and 3. And we have that a little bit now with, um, with the carbon load, you know. Is it going to, I mean, on the bus, two of the people coming in from the airport were saying, well, you know, the, uh, what was it, uh, the margin of error is 200 million or billion tons of carbon, you know. What does 200 billion tons of carbon look like? What does it smell like? What does it feel like? So while that's the important measure for people who are involved, and you want to look at Kusile and say, is it a good thing, a bad thing, it's going to pump out that much, it doesn't really work at all well for those of us who are trying to tell the story on the ground. So the, the four things I think that are important is that we need to make the debate accessible. We need to make it credible. We need to make it, and this is, I think, for me, the most important lesson out of AIDS, we need to make it about me. And the best way to tell it, I believe, is we need to make it about news. So making it accessible there's a, there's a temptation to put out a supplement, you know. Let's have a 12-pager and we'll get people to advertise in it and we'll do 23 stories on the topic of COP17. Well, you know and I know that 95% of the readers of any newspaper take that straight to the, to the cat bin or to the waste bin. Very few people open and read those big package supplements, except, of course, the people in the know. The people who contributed, the people who wrote it, the people who talk about it probably all take it home and say, that's a great piece of journalism. But it doesn't reach anybody who isn't already in the game. So I'm not too keen on that form of doing it, where, as I say, tomorrow we'll run a double-page spread, and that's about as much as I would ever want to do in one go on a topic like this for a non-specialist audience like mine. We need to tell it in plain language. As I've said before, the alphabet soup that goes with environment and goes with AIDS and goes with law and all the other things we need to avoid. Um, as we were trying to look at it, you know that old thing, a picture is worth a thousand words, and the modern equivalent of that would be the infographic, and it really is worth a thousand words. You know, if you get the good infographic that's full of however it's done, but you know, the, the map that shows you how the ice is shrinking there and shows you how the desert's warming here, and pulls it together. It's rather like uh, if it's well done. It's the, the view of the good general standing on the hilltop who sees the whole war. He can see the battle over here, and he can see the battle over there, and he can see that if this one happens there, what's going to happen over here? And that takes thousands of words to tell. You know, if you're trying to explain that if this guy wins here, and send somebody over there, then that'll happen. And the infographic is, is a great way to do it. I mean, it's not for nothing <clears throat> that Time magazine is starting to look like a comic book these days. The first third of Time magazine is little blocks and little diagrams and things. Because probably most of us here would pick up a copy of The Economist and find that great slab of gray an invitation to sit down and have a jolly good read. But that isn't actually how most, of, most consumers of media work. They do it in very small bites, um, and uh, it needs to be presented in a way that is, that is attractive and easily accessible. On the accessibility thing, I don't think government has done hugely well. Mervyn, will you tap the table if I'm going too long? Huh? <laughs> um, they've, they, I think government probably thinks that they've put a tremendous effort into promoting COP17, but it's been a pull rather than a push. They are not getting out there and finding, as far as I'm aware, and, and it may be different for you, but they're not finding the right journalists and going and saying, here, we've come to tell you. Every now and then, my YouTube pops her hand up and says, I'm going to be in Pretoria at 11 o'clock to give you an update on COP17. And they'll usually tell you at 9 o'clock. It's, it's a kind of come to us when we're ready and we'll tell you about it. So it hasn't been very well promoted on that level, unfortunately. Um, but that's, that's uh, you know, we, we can still go and find it out. It's not, not that difficult. 
The accessibility thing, if we in newspapers tell the story simply in plain language and in an attractive way, the one great thing we have now that we didn't have 30 years ago when AIDS was first coming onto the agenda is the web and how newspapers can interact with their own websites. So we can tell a story and we can point you to our website and put in much more there, which is still plain language. And then there, put in the links to your websites, to the government websites, so that it's a drill down process and people can easily get hooked into it and can drill as far as they're ready to today and maybe tomorrow or the next day they'll want to drill a little further. So we do have a lot of those kind of tools available to us. <clears throat> we need to make it credible. And who makes it credible? Much as I like her, and she is very charming, Maita isn't the voice that's going to persuade everybody that climate change is, is a big issue. You know, uh, Wangari Maiti, Mai, Maitai, <laughs> the Nobel winner, the Kenyan, she probably did more than anybody in Africa to put environmental issues on the agenda because it was somebody like me talking to me to a lot of Africans. It wasn't a person with a rich American accent or from somewhere else or a professor. It made it, I think, real for a lot of people. And we need to have those sort of voices. For our coverage of um, the actual COP17, we haven't got the budget to send anybody there. But we've got a Rhodes specialist, a, a PhD student at Rhodes who's done a lot of study on this and he's going to be blogging from there and he'll be blogging for us as well. So we have somebody from our patch um, in Grahamstown who hopefully will tell the story for our area in a way that will make it readable to us and we'll save money and all that kind of stuff too. For me though, the, the most important lesson is, is making it about me. And me might not be you. you know, for me at, at, at the dispatch, I can drive around Mditsani for a month and I will still not know what it feels like to be me born in Mditsani and likely to die in Mditsani. That's beyond me. So you need to get people to get involved in reporting it who can talk to people like themselves. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, if you think of how how all of us use the news. We're probably at the top of the news food chain here in this room. We consume huge amounts of it. We probably read quite extensively and read large chunks of it and probably feel we read pretty much everything. But I bet that all of you have no-go areas. You know, when you get the newspaper or whatever, whatever it might be, you're not interested in four by four trails, you're not interested in fishing, you're not interested in soccer, you're not interested in the stock market, whatever it is. There are a whole lot of areas which as you scan the paper, you automatically blank out. You just don't pause there. And for most of the reading public, climate change is one of those. They're not looking into their newspaper to say, I wonder what I can find out about climate change today. So you've got to find ways to draw them in. Um, the making it about me, thank you, making it about me, it, one of the lessons from HIV, if you remember when it first started, the white people thought it was a black problem, the straights thought it was a gay problem, the Asians thought it was an African problem, the old people thought it was a young problem, and the young people thought they were going to live forever for anyway. So it has to be, and this was, I think, Mervyn's most important, the line I wrote down from what you were saying, it has to be a bread and butter issue. You were saying that the poor are the people who are going to be hit hardest. But how do you actually make that real? How do you say to somebody, uh, even about jobs, you know, how do you make it real there? And I think the way to do that, best of all, is to tell it through news, not to tell it through large chunks of specialized cover. If one can write the news and not sit down and say, well, now I'm going to tell these people about climate change, Tell a story, and at the end of that story, you can almost say, if not in so many words, oh, by the way, that was about climate change. So that it gets inserted into our daily discourse, it gets inserted into the political discourse, the social discourse, because it's news, because we're telling people things about things that fall under the climate change topic, but are not about climate change. And that's what I'm going to be trying to do with the dispatch, and I think it's our best way to put and keep this topic on the agenda. Thank you.